How do we make sense of the many contradictions in our culture? Is the answer thinking the unthinkable? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this episode, we explore our culture's contradictions and what they mean for our fellow Americans trying to live a meaningful life. We're going to share with you an interview we did with Dr. Kirby Farrell a number of years ago. Kirby Farrell is a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He is the author of Post-Traumatic Culture and other books of literary and cultural criticism, including Berserk Style in America and The Psychology of Abandon, as well as several novels. He was a regular contributor to Psychology Today Online. He's also a jazz pianist and a composer. Here's the interview with Dr. Farrell. Welcome, Dr. Farrell. Thanks very much, Steve. Ken? Great to have you here. Kirby, some of your work has been described as cultural criticism. Could you tell us what that is? Well, culture is the operating system for groups of people. The, the other animals have instinct and hardwired controls over their behavior. Human beings tend to control behavior with symbolic forms, rules, knowledge, the sum of all that we know that shapes how we control the environment and our own behavior, fantasies, and the stories that we tell would all be part of culture. And cultural criticism is the, the study, the attempt to understand how those very complex and historically uh, mysterious uh, forms have come into being and how they are shaping the behavior that we know today. Our friend Freud here, in his later career, spent much of his time thinking not so much about individuals as about how groups arrive at their behavior, and especially in reaction to the First World War, which was utterly devastating, just as the Second War was in, and the, all the wars were in the 20th century for us. Now, you've used the phrase, thinking the unthinkable. What, what is that? Well, it's helpful to think of Freud, after all, who pointed out that there are all kinds of rules and regulations in culture, but they're not always conscious. In fact, Becker says much of what we know about life we deliberately keep on the margins and out of sight because it's so threatening to us. We're, after all, the only animals on the earth that have to come to terms with our, our limitations, the fact that we all die, life is in some sense, insoluble for us. So from Becker's point of view, that deep information is very powerful. It's always having a terrific influence on our motives, and yet it's very often dissociated or screened out. So one of the things I think we try to do thinking about culture is to ask, where is that hidden knowledge located, and what would it mean if we could understand it better? Would it enable us to get a better grip on some of the behaviors that are so destructive, as well as some of the, the uh, fantasies and stories and behaviors that make us better people and more successful in life? Well, our society today would have to be said to be a mass of contradictions. And you wrote the following, a regimented society preaches individual initiative. Planning can manage worldwide business, but cannot relieve poverty in a neighborhood across town. Rewards work best for those at the top, while punishment and deprivation best inspire those at the bottom. What is at the heart of our society's contradictions? Well, I would argue that historically we're at a moment we've seen a century of unbelievable change, a pace that has rapidly accelerated. The scale of life is far beyond the capacity of most individuals to appreciate. We have technological ways of knowing things about the world that expand our imaginative horizons. We're not living in villages anymore. And yet at the same time, that makes us aware of how little we can control. And since World War II, there's been a kind of unprecedented prosperity in America, which has amounted to a, a freedom of possible lifestyle and, and consumer goods that has made the number of roles available to people in society far more complex and varied than might have been the case in the past, and we're still sorting all of that out. And one consequence is that the sorting process is highly competitive and sometimes very ambivalent, full of aggressive feelings and greed for life and success, as well as more generous and understanding. So that's the contradiction, that mm -hmm. we, have, we have this 
these kind of basic instincts or, or, or needs, greed, and, and on the other hand, we think of ourselves a different way? Is that what you're saying? Well, what Ernest Becker would say is that since everybody has to come to terms with those problems of survival anxiety, you know, the, how to explain and come to accept the limits of your own life, your own death, Becker would argue that culture usually encodes stories that make us feel as if life is lastingly significant. So culture, in a way, becomes a kind of symbolic immortality. As long as your culture is feeling good and makes you feel right and secure in the world, you don't bother, you don't feel perturbed by those anxious, dark thoughts in the middle of the night. When culture is conflicted, when your particular role might be canceled out by the stress of unemployment or all of the disturbing social phenomena that, that I would say add up to a fear of social death, of being a non-entity. Nobody recognizes you. In those cases, then the culture actually becomes threatening, and you're likely to feel either very depressive and guilty and paralyzed, or you're likely to externalize that stress in the form of aggression, rage, scapegoating other people, especially those who are you think might be below you for one reason or another. So what you see in American culture, on the one hand, is a dream of consumer utopia in which everybody's heroic purpose is extravagantly clear and everlasting. And on the other hand, at the same time, it's paid for by a system of factory work not necessarily literally factories, but a kind of bureaucratized and regimented society that guarantees its security by scapegoating people who are in competition for those desirable goals. And so, for example, Americans have one of the largest, if not the largest, prison system in the world. California has more of its population proportionally in prison than any country on earth. So the contradictions in this society are really very pronounced and, and I would say, violent. Uh, on the one hand, you've got a society that believes in a religious found foundation of generosity and forgiveness and mercy, and yet we're also the most militarized society in history, not just recently, but in, in uh, all human history. So the contradictions amount to a kind of practical insanity which we all cheerfully agree to keep under control and not talk about because it would make us all extraordinarily nervous. I, I, I think controlled insanity might describe some, some folks that I know, but, but most, I think most Americans would cling to or would, would argue that we are the most free country in the world, and it's our freedom that makes us the greatest country on earth. How would you respond to them? Well, yeah, everything is relative. I mean, free, free compared to what? Freedom can be defined in all kinds of different ways. Well, freedom of speech, freedom uh -huh. of the press, freedom to vote. I mean, our, our rights as Americans. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as compared to, say, countries in the Middle East where they're living under oppressive regimes or, or a communist Special country. Religion. Yeah, mm -hmm. freedom of religion. All right. Well, I mean, if you compare us to other industrial countries, for example, American culture has just about the weakest labor laws, so you're very vulnerable when you're working for a living in America. You can be dismissed at any time. It's much harder to organize labor in this country than it is anywhere else. Americans work several hundred hours more a year than Europeans do, for example. The, you know, the time clock and electronic policing of labor is not something that we should ignore in a world that's getting ever more computerized. Elections, yes, that works. But then again, um, you know, many other countries have elections too. So it's not at all clear to me that you can measure these things in any simple way. One, one way of looking at this question is to say, what are you and your neighbors doing most of your waking lives? And if you look back, if you stand back and look, you see that most people are in fact caught up in routine and in habit. Sitting on the expressway. Yeah, you know, living, yeah. living in a magic circle of repeated habitual behavior that makes you feel secure, that makes you feel nothing can happen to me. As long as I do what I did yesterday, I'll be okay. Nothing, nothing can disrupt the, the magic of that protection. So there's a, a profound dishonesty in us when we say we're living for freedom because, as Eric Fromm, the psychologist, said, you know, most people are living to escape, you know, from freedom because freedom actually makes us extremely nervous. 
When you're young, you think, well, I'm going to hitchhike to California tomorrow. I'm going to, I'm going to bolt from my job. I'm going to step out of school and stick out my thumb. But in fact, very few of the young do this. The last time anybody did this in numbers was in the 1960s. And, in, and we actually pride ourselves now on having outgrown this foolishness. So I think we're very ambivalent about freedom. I, wouldn't, I would be reluctant to get too enthusiastic without a, a critical sense of it. Kirby, some people would argue that American freedom allows for more potential for crime and therefore imprisonment. How would you respond to that? Well, one problem is that American prison systems are enormously enlarged of late, but they tend to be full of nonviolent criminals. I mean, in California, for example, only one out of five people who's been imprisoned for the California Three Strikes Law is actually, I believe, there for reasons of violent crime. Most of the others are what we would think of, I think, practically as relatively trivial offenses. Some of them are minor drug offenses. Uh, when some prisoners appeal to the Supreme Court trying to overturn or modify the three strikes law, one of the prisoners was serving a virtual life sentence, I believe, for stealing something like $100 of videos from a convenience store. Another stole a $75 golf club. Uh, and this means the taxpayers in California are paying something like $20,000 a year per person to incarcerate that individual. So from this point of view, the freedom in American culture is not necessarily closely connected to punishment at all. I would say, on the contrary, that, that you're seeing most people showing a heightened sense, demand for security, and that demand for security makes for less tolerance, which is paradoxical. It's just the opposite of an attitude of freedom for everybody. But this country is arguably the most industrialized, and we can point to less manual labor, all our necessities are met. Industrialization has been a huge success in terms of our lifestyle. How would you respond to that? Are we ambivalent about that as well? Well, there's no question that industrialism has improved the, the quality of life in terms of material goods. We no longer worry about getting through the winter with enough calories to, to last till spring, a problem which haunted Europe until the 18th century. Peasants, when the weather started getting cold, would feel that little chill of anxiety about whether there would be enough food in the pantry to get through. On the other hand, like most things in life, the, the plenty that comes with consumer goods and consumer bounty um, also brings with it sacrifices. You know, it means regimentation, it means monotony, it means repetition. This becomes very interesting in Becker's terms, because he would argue that if culture is fundamentally an immortality system designed to make you relax and feel at home in the world and unconcerned about your ultimate fate, justified by your everyday routine, then going to the factory, punching in the time clock, being monitored, doing the same meaningless task over and over and over again until you drop, would be a nightmare. Whether the factory is Henry Ford's auto uh, assembly plant or whether it's computer key punch operating, the threat is that heroic purpose, the sense of value, individual value, has been automated and, in effect, robotized. I think this is why American movies are full of terrifying plots about people turning into robots, like the Stepford Wives, or, or invasions of vicious and sadistic crushing robots. Terminator. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold. Yeah, Arnold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Uh, Kirby, you've said that heroic purpose, like energy, is in short supply. What does that mean, and why is it important? Well, if you think about it, you're living in one of the most competitive of industrial societies. I mean, we have fewer of the guarantees that stabilize, for example, European industrial societies. Uh, you, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world in terms of employment, for example, and the safety net is a little thinner on the bottom. And as a result, what that means is that there's an intense scramble to get meaningful work and meaningful careers and meaningful lives. If you don't get those things, you are pulled by gravity towards social death 
and social death, I would imagine, is just as terrifying as real death. You know, this is what we talk about in euphemistic terms when we speak about the inner city or gangs, you know, struggling, youth gangs, and so forth and so on. What we're really talking about is the terror of not counting in society and wanting to do something about that. And the competition, I think, means that the heroic values are in short supply. I mean, you, you know, ask your, you know, ask yourself as you look at the young growing up today, where are the heroic models? What can you do? This is a particularly a problem that is haunting because as feminism has made it more logical and more satisfying for women to think about other kinds of heroic values beyond, say, the role of, of Betty Crocker and, and the good housewife, they end up competing with men for scarce jobs, scarce positions of authority and value and so forth. From this point of view, it's really interesting because the competition involves now men and women, but the economy itself has been in declining shape, really, since World War II in some ways. We now, since the 1980s, since the Vietnam War, it now takes two wage earners in a family to break even to hold up the middle class standard. So this has done insidiously damaging things to the family and to the integrity of marriages. And it's also created competition in the workplace that might not have been there before. We're very slow solving these problems, considering that they're happy and happening at a dizzying, almost a drunken pace. And it's not at all clear to me that uh, we can see any immediate way of calming down some of these struggles for meaning. It seems like what we get from the television, the radio, the, is consumerism. And mm. it, we're, we're in a consumer utopia. How is that falling short from giving us this meaning you're talking about? Well, I think Becker would argue that from an anthropological point of view, consumer utopia is like hunter-gatherer behavior which is to say it's food behavior. And consumer utopia is the fantasy that you can always take in more life. There will never be a shortage of it. And of course, in the real world, that's a dream. How much is enough? You know, I mean, you're looking at a culture in which the doctors are telling us diabetes and, and obesity are chronic and dangerous health problems. Why is that? Well, people are hungry, and the culture is, so to speak, overfeeding them. And the, the answer, I would say, has to point us in the direction of an emotional need that's not getting met. Becker, I think, would say, well, it's because people are feeling canceled out by stress and by the failure of the social world to reward your sense of real being and real presence. You know, you, you look in the mirror and people don't give you a sense of yourself, enough of a sense of yourself. And as a result, you try to compensate by filling in with those symbolic needs. Culture has a dual responsibility, making heroic purpose and managing terror. Mm -hmm. How are we doing at managing our terror? One way of thinking about this is to say that the positive response to those inescapable creaturely needs we have is to look for meaning and purpose, and whether it's in family bonding or friendship or communication, the reinforcing the reality of other people, helping to calm other people down so they can think clearly, so we can think clearly. The flip side of this, as Becker describes in that book that I'm sure you've mentioned on the show, Escape from Evil, is that there's a false solution to that terror that involves scapegoating and aggression, annihilation of others. You know, if you can kill somebody else, in effect, you identify with death. You become the power of death. And right now, I think this is why American culture is terrifically conflicted. As a result of World War II, and we'll talk about this in the next show, as a result of World War II, we are militarized in an unprecedented fashion. I mean, a huge amount of our resources goes into I mean, many, many times more than any other country on Earth, not just incremental, but magnitudes of, uh, I think it's, you know, uh, 10 times the nearest competitor. It's a, it's a very large number. Uh, the fact that I'm having trouble remembering how large <laughs> it is is an indication of where we are in this problem. It's bigger than we are, and I think, frankly, we're understandably quite terrified of it. And in terms of our culture, you do a wonderful seminar on RoboCop. 
which I think is just, it's, it's funny and scary at the same time. But make-believe violence is, is a big part of our culture. Well, violence, I think, probably operates on a kind of continuum in our behavior. It's violence when you become preoccupied with security and the next thing you know you have the world's most aggressive police force out there monitoring and jailing low-status people. What is it, one out of three or maybe even more now black males in America is likely to be in trouble with the legal system at some point during a lifetime. This is clearly not just a problem of individual black men, but clearly a cultural problem. So, you know, this becomes part of that aggressive feeling, working out aggression. You look at those reality cop shows. They're always about militarized police, which is to say paramilitary, uniformed, they've got hardware, they've got weapons, they've got the tools of coercion and control. And what are they doing? They're almost always humiliating and and suppressing low-status people. You know, people that we say casually and sometimes cruelly, sometimes not, hey, they're losers. And it's because you're tacitly enjoying the death, the triumph over people. You know, he, their foolishness proves how heroic you are, how much you deserve to live. And I, I would just argue that the, this paradigm of suppressing undesirable others is repeated over and over again in industrial entertainment. How can we, at this point, so we're getting towards the end here, how can we have a positive effect? Well, I wouldn't you think that the only way you can deal with the, compl- the complex situation we find ourselves in and the conflicted creatures that we are, only trying to understand the conflict gives you any kind of control over it, I think. The other thing I think we need to do that would be really worth exploring in more detail is to try to use education to develop really a love of the grace and the poise and the, and the depth of the courage, the depth of understanding it takes to deal with these questions. It's much too easy to dismiss other people, to turn them into flat, two-dimensional, beautifully colored computer-generated images on a page. It's too easy to turn them into sitcoms in which, you know, there's a, there's a humor that is generated by scapegoating other people. So from that point of view, I mean, in a, in a very crude way that is so profound, I certainly can't sum up. It means we have to teach each other, in effect, to love, to praise, to enjoy, to delight, to relish one another. I think a lot of people are hungry. I see it in my students. They're hungry for meaning. You know, I tell my colleagues this, and sometimes they look at me askance, but my experience has been that young people are growing up in a world that they sense is intensely consumer-oriented, commercialized. Lives are commodities. Things are programmed on a computer model, a schematic model, and the kids feel this isn't enough. They're hungry for something that's worth loving. That seems like a positive thing. Our guest has been Dr. Kirby Farrell of UMass Amherst. Kirby, thank you for a terrific conversation. Thank you, Kirby. My pleasure. You've been listening to an interview with Kirby Farrell, talking about the contradictions in our society and the effect it has on us, its members. Our show is called The Hub for Important Ideas, and Kirby has many vitally important ideas that resonate with us. We're going to enumerate the main ones now, but we're not going to go too deeply into their implications in this podcast. We're going to pick them up on the next episode. Yeah, and we'll come back to them in the future, too, because they're so fundamental to our way of thinking. Yeah, there's a real lot in this uh, in this episode and also the other one that we did with them. Um, I, I like the notion, although it makes me uncomfortable, thinking the unthinkable it means we got to get a handle on the deep information that's uh, powering our society and look at the rules that are not in our conscious thoughts. It's an amazing concept. Kirby is just one of the most brilliant thinkers that I've ever come across. He's an amazing character. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and to me, thinking the unthinkable means having the courage to bring up ideas that you probably have been socialized into not dealing with. Yep. Getting at the oldest parts of your upbringing is impossible. You, You can't remember because socialization begins when you're born. Right. So how can you remember when the process began? But pulling apart 
your most essential values and questioning them consciously can be an excruciating experience that most people won't or can't do. Thinking the unthinkable is hard for every individual. Thinking the unthinkable at the heart of our society, well, that's what cultural criticism is and can be equally problematic. Yeah. So I'm struck with the whole idea of cultural criticism. We learned that from Kirby. We learned what it is. He really showed us what it means and gave us the impetus to adopt that description for our own work as well. Yeah, I love how he brings it up when he says uh, there are a lot of ideas that have to be pushed down or not talked about in order for society to function efficiently and, and move forward without a lot of distraction. But those ideas are still there, even though we're not talking about them. And Kirby says what a cultural critic does is look at those things that we're not talking about to see how not talking about them is affecting the culture at large. Yeah, that's a big one. People don't generally think about the unconscious, their unconscious minds, or what is unconscious in their culture. We're not programmed that way by evolution. Right. Evolution programmed us to survive and reproduce. And thinking about the unconscious mind doesn't really benefit either of those activities. There's a reason it's unconscious. And there's a good reason why it's unconscious. Because quite often, it's just uncomfortable. You don't need to know it, and you don't want to know it. it right, and it's, it's going to interfere with your performance in the world. It can, yeah. It, it can. can also greatly improve your performance in the world. Well, that's what, that's what like when people get into therapy, a, a place where people start to think about the unconscious a lot for the first time is if they enter psychotherapy in some form, where you're trying to kind of open the hood and <laughs> look at the engine and see why it's not running as smoothly as you might like. And that's the first time usually, you know, people... You know, they, they like to say, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it is broke, you got to fix it. And the unconscious is one of the first places yeah. you look. Yeah. The next one is a is a tough one. The fear of social death. He talks about social death as opposed to actual physical death. But social death can be as terrifying as, as actually dying when culture becomes depressive. And I want to talk in our next episode when we get into this, Jonathan Haidt, who I like tremendously, has done a number of podcasts and presentations that I've listened to more than once because there's so much in them. But he talks about teen suicides as a phenomenon. He's a statistician, so he's got all the numbers, which I'll have next time we talk. But he traces a lot of the current problems back to the advent of smart cell phones, and not specifically when they were invented necessarily, but when they got into the hands of young people in the hands of many, if not most, young people and the effect that it's had on them. And it's it's very upsetting with bullying. And so, some of the subjects have been discussed a lot, but uh, he's got a very interesting take on it. We'll get into that more uh, next time. Yeah, I think the whole idea of social death is an important one. I've maintained that avoiding social death or countering social death was the primary motivation for voting for Donald Trump in 2016. Hmm. The American middle class workers were fighting to ward off social death for themselves and their families and what, 30 years of wage stagnation? Yep. Lots of good paying union jobs and the economic collapse of 2008. And it seems like only Trump understood, whether it was an intellectual understanding or it was intuitive, whether he he gleaned this from listening to talk radio like Mark Levin and Rush Limbaugh and people, but he understood it, and he promised to end what he called American carnage. No one seemed to understand what that was, American mm. carnage. It just sounded like something he made up, of course, because he, he makes up stuff all the time. But that's what I think. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was the American carnage is closely tied to what people would call business as usual. Yeah, well, that the, the same old, same old. You know, more of what we more of what we've been getting. And I think people finally said, "No, I I don't want more of what we've been getting. I'll take I'll take different, no matter just because it's different. I'm picking that." Yeah, and his use of the word carnage reminds you of Becker's using the words terror and horror, and yeah. in terror management theory. Well. Right. Well, carnage sounds this sounds like one of those. Oh, it is. 
he's, yeah, he was describing social death, and people were desperate, and when they, when when they're desperate, they do desperate things. Sometimes stupid things, yep. like voting for a game show host. But <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. Well, well, but that's what they the, did. The, yeah. Well, the next election is probably going to turn on whether or not he keeps that promise or whether people perceive that he kept that promise. And perception is what it's all about. Yep. And where you get your news from determines your perception, who your neighbors are, who their, uh, what their lawn signs say, all of that. Yep. So let's go on to the other big idea that Kirby was advancing here. And I, I don't know that this is his original idea necessarily, but it's a big one that he brings up quite often when he's talking about consumer utopia. Wonderful phrase. Oh, yeah. He called it a hunter-gatherer behavior and, and food behavior. And I like when you said earlier when we were talking, uh, you mentioned the word obesity in America because it's probably the number one cause of death now in our country is uh, health issues relating to obesity. People are eating too much. And, and as Kirby said, in America, you can always take in more life. Right. But people are, but people are hungry for more than just food. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? And I think when they don't know, what the, yeah, they don't know what, we don't know what we're hungry for. So much to the uh, enjoyment of the snack food industry, we just keep shoving stuff in our mouths, hoping, so, hoping something will make us feel better. Yeah, to you fill know, the void. To fill a void, right. To fill a void. I think it's an amazing analogy. And whether it's psychologically true, now, Kirby's not a psychologist, but he certainly plays one on television. Yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> That's yeah having does. written for Psychology Today for, I don't know how many, uh, five years or more, writing the books that he does, he's obviously a person who thinks very hard about psychology. And he's using food as more than just a metaphor. Yeah. He says people are looking for meaning and purpose. They're hungry for meaning. Right. And, and we didn't bring up religion in the interview, but the decline in religion in our social fabric, and I'm not saying religion's going away or anything like that, but it's not as important in our culture as it has been in our history. Right. And I believe that decline is at the heart of the search for meaning in our culture. No question about that. Yeah. When you've, you've had, it's been like a backbone for hundreds of years, and now all of a sudden, you know, in a one or two lifespans, it's declined. Not negligible, there's parts of the country where it's really still very much in full, full force, but there's also places where it's just now completely marginalized. And some of that full force, I mean, is actually a backlash against secularism, against materialism. Yep. It's an attempt to bring back the past, not necessarily in a nostalgic way, but in a way that right that will bring back the values of that culture of our culture our shared culture yep and young people are hungry for that they're hungry for something that will give them a purpose absolutely are they want purpose they want meaning and they're hungry and they're stuffing their faces with junk food i i know that's a stretch and maybe it's not true but it sure sounds true when he says it it's at least I think it's at least partly true. Yeah, I like his suggestion that we have to try to understand um, the conflict in our society and use education to explore the grace and poise. He says we must teach people how to love. Isn't that something? I just that was just startling. Uh, yeah, first grace and poise. I thought that was that was just poetic and terrific. Two subjects that are too little understood, let alone practiced. Right. And how do we get beyond consumerism as a way of life? Careful now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you mean you mean you mean that the capitalists will come to get me? Well, I'm a conspiracy theorist uh wannabe from the sidelines and you know, as long as the big machine is turning, everybody's fine. Yeah, oh, okay. Well, well after 9/11, George W. Bush's message to the country was go shopping. Go, go shopping. shopping. Right. Go well, shopping. Because- like shopping as a way of life. Well, and, and as I say, it keeps, it keeps this amazing machine that we live in running. Yeah, um, and the pandemic. It's not, it's... Well, yeah. the pandemic has certainly exposed what shopping means to people. Uh, absolutely. It's not just getting food. It's getting out there and staring in windows and going and handling stuff in stores and all of this, this whole 
mystique going to the mall. I'm going to the mall like you're going on vacation or something. It, it shopping is a whole thing, and consumerism is, for better or worse, it's the value that we have in our society. You're right. It keeps the it, it keeps the gears moving on the big machine, but it's also what we value most. Well, and and at what cost? And at what cost? At what cost that machine keeps turning? True. But just cursory glances at TV, and I don't usually watch broadcast TV that much, but just the, the when you, when you when you're exposed to the commercials, the relentless barrage of car commercials and food commercials and medicine commercials, yeah, and it's it's just the cars, so many different brands and styles, and you just stop and say, why are you why are you subjecting everyone? To these relentless car commercials, they must pay off. It's it's got to be worth something to somebody somewhere. But I can't imagine how watching a hundred car commercials when I don't need a car, I don't I don't need a new car. What is that? They they they're not looking for you right now. No, they're looking for your neighbor who needs a new car. They're looking for my they're, neighbor's kid who needs a car, yeah. Well, they're and they're looking for you in in 2 years and 3 months when you need a new car. Yeah. Again. Maybe. I mean, it's just a, you know, like a Ferris wheel that keeps going around. It's not but, your time to get on. But what yet. It, so hit the mute so hit the mute button. But what it's conveying is this lifestyle of happy, beautiful people cuz you never see an ugly person driving one of these cars, right? They're all models. They're all or, they're all fashion or models. Or on TV, you really don't see an ugly person on Except TV. Except in the news. Or as they said in one episode of The Simpsons, they said, "No, we we mean TV ugly. <laughs> we don't mean we don't mean yeah. actually uh, ugly." So so you get these models, male female models, and they're all smiling and they're happy and they're driving off. They're driving through the city. They're driving to the country. They're driving to the beach. They've got their kids. And isn't life great? Isn't life great? Oh, life in America is just wonderful. If you're from the moon and you just know you're from outer space and all you saw were car commercials, you'd say, I want to live there. Yeah. That's just so wonderful there. And even the, even like I said, the medications, the, the medicine commercials. Well, you've got like 60 seconds of caveats in the commercial. Don't take this if you got heart trouble and don't take this if you're allergic. I, Right. Like, they got to tell you, don't take this pill if you're allergic to it, right? Yeah, I love that one. I love that one. <laughs> and what what kind of idiots do they think we are? But when you see them after they've taken the pill, they're so happy, and they're with their grandchildren, and they're out playing, and they're all, life is grand for those people. Oh, I saw, I saw one where... Uh... The, it's the husband who the wife is the one with the depression, but the husband is the one who looks happy after the pill because one of the parent byproducts is she's going to get her uh, sex drive back. <laughs> so, so the husband is the one who's smiling <laughs> and, at that. And one. cook him a nice meal while she's at it. And co- yeah, what all that, all that stuff, uh, all that crazy. So what Kirby is? Wow. Kirby is looking at our society, and he's just pulling open the kimono and saying. Take a look at the contradictions that are inherent. Just look at how absurd this stuff is. And look how it, in some ways, destructive it is. Yeah. We're trying to make ourselves feel good about ourselves to ward off death anxiety, which is, of course, what every culture does on on some level to some degree. And all the forerunners of it, like, you know, depression and other forms of mental illness. Oh, I mean... We have, as Sheldon Solomon said, a petri dish of psychopathologies. <laughs> yeah, we talked about it in the very first episode. Sure. What What's all the things that are wrong, and yet our way to address that they're wrong, our way to fix them, is to create this nonsense, this collective insanity that we're calling a culture. Yeah, a lot to go through, and we're going to pick this up. On our next outing. Yeah, we're going to, we've got a lot more to talk about here. That There's a lot to this. Yeah, this is a teaser. So join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. 
You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. Subscribe on your favorite platform. We have nine for you to choose from. And if we're not on your favorite, let us know, and we'll do our best to be there for you. And support us on Patreon. We are 100% listener supported. Yes, we are. Thank you, everyone, for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.